while calling Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone purely a horror series downplays its brilliance within the sci-fi and speculative fiction genres, there's no denying that several of the show's episodes set out to scare you and weren't ashamed of it. And boy, don't we remember when they did. Do you remember now? You scream so loud, Helen. You scream so loud. If you've rewatched any of the classic series lately, you'll come to see that Twilight Zone doesn't show its age so much as reintroducing us to why things we came to think of as cheesy actually once worked so well. The terrors within the Twilight Zone are irrational, single-minded, even often bordering upon omnipotent within the realms of each episode. It was a show consistently determined to teach a lesson, and in its forays into the horror genre, that lesson was packaged alongside sights, sounds, and characters determined to scare you straight into another dimension. Let me out in the name of God, let me out! TalkHorror.com presents the 10 scariest episodes of The Twilight Zone. The Howling Man. The Twilight Zone may have favored modern stories over gothic horror, but you can't say it was because they weren't good at the latter. In particular, The Howling Man breaches the walls of both eras to spin an unsettling tale about superstition and trust. When an American tourist lost in Europe in the years after World War I finds himself begging for shelter at the doors of a hermitage, its inhabitants, the Brothers of Truth, reluctantly allow him to recuperate within their walls. During the night, the man hears an agonized howl coming from one of the castle's chambers, and discovers a man being held captive by the Brothers, a man they claim is no man at all, but the devil himself. On top of the brief but effective period of suspense in which the audience is left to wonder who the real villain of the episode is, The Howling Man accentuates the suspense with some of the series' moodiest gothic set pieces, off-kilter camera work, and an effective soundtrack consisting of patched-together stock cues from Twilight Zone regulars Bernard Herrmann and Jerry Goldsmith to construct an atmosphere that would leave Terence Fisher red-faced in envy and when the sky was opened. The Twilight Zone has a great record of knocking horror stories out of the park, but on occasion its pure spec-fi episodes could put them to shame. One such case is that of In When the Sky Was Opened, an episode that one would be hard-pressed to classify as horror, but is one of the most horrifying nonetheless. In the story two, or was it three, astronauts return from space aboard an experimental craft after having been missing from all radar for 24 hours. In contrast to how a horror story would typically play out, there's nothing that followed them on the way to Earth, but there is something that wants to take them back. It's like I didn't belong here. When it has its feelers over its victim, they are struck by an ominous feeling of dissociation, I could disappear. As memories, mementos, and finally history itself are erased, to make it as though they never existed. With a body that can't be found, and a victim that can't be traced, there are no allies to be had in the hunt for an active killer that may as well not exist. And if you remember that last victim, then it probably means you're next. In a series known for milking inescapable fate for all it's worth, and when the sky was opened is perhaps the most merciless example of it to be found in the Twilight Zone. The After Hours Verging on simple even by Twilight Zone standards, the After Hours centers around a woman going to a department store to buy a golden thimble. Unable to find it in the gift section, she's escorted to the store's ninth floor, a dark and deserted room with empty display cases and no staff, save for a lone sales lady who is selling one item, a golden thimble. When she gets out, she finds that the gift isn't up to her standards, but upon trying to return it, she's told that there is no ninth floor, and when she sees the sales lady again, she's not the same. Dozing off after a fit of anxiety, she awakens to find she's been abandoned and locked in, but not alone. As quickly as this plot seems to whiz by, the claustrophobic set design makes each shot through the deserted store come alive. The After Hours manages to pack a number of creepy moments into its taut frame, leading into a conclusion that while far from horrific in itself, is delivered with such creeping effectiveness 
It Stands Tall was an episode that will stay in your nightmares. Perchance to Dream Perchance to Dream, the ninth of 156 original run Twilight Zone episodes, was arguably the first one to plunge head deep into horror territory. It remains both one of the most unabashedly artsy episodes and one of the most surreally terrifying. Perchance to Dream deals with a man with a deadly combination of conditions, a weak heart, and an imagination he cannot seem to control. He relates a story to a psychiatrist about how his fears of a murderer hiding in his back seat developed into a sequential dream of an exotic dancer who lures him through the dizzying world of the nightmare carnival she inhabits, seemingly determined to push him into a final shock. Perchance the dream story of a man doomed to a terrible fate awaiting him in his dreams beat Wes Craven's Nightmare on Elm Street to its premise by nearly 25 years, and even eerily predates the true story that directly inspired it. It makes you feel as though you are trapped in the body of Edward Hall, as he is trapped in a particularly perilous bad dream. While Maya the Cat Girl plays with her cornered prey, you can imagine every thump of Edward's accelerating heartbeat. Just make sure you can stop imagining once you start. The Midnight Sun H.P. Lovecraft once described cosmic horror as the unexplainable dread of outer, unknown forces. The Midnight Sun is cosmic horror of another sort, one in which the terror comes from a precisely known menace that is nonetheless just as bleak for its characters as any extra-dimensional, madness-inducing being. That menace is global warming. And not the mundane, real-life mankind could fix this if we really tried global warming, either. No, in this case, the planet Earth has left its orbit and is careening towards the sun at an unnatural rate. One month into the catastrophe, the Earth is already so saturated by the sun's rays that it no longer experiences nighttime. There is no chance of survival to be found. This in the back of our minds, we observe the last two remaining tenants of an apartment building struggling to cope with the social fallout preceding their impending doom. Counting the hours until the water returns, painting cool places, lamenting the cold truth that in a matter of months or maybe weeks, the human race will crawl to its total death by heat stroke. A crawl we see hit a boiling point in the last seconds of the episode's climax. And let the water come down over me. The Midnight Sun provides a chilling reminder of how fragile a place in the Goldilocks Zone can be. The Dummy Jerry Etherson is a ventriloquist who suffers from a problem common to ventriloquists in horror media. His dummy, Willie, is alive. Or at least he thinks it is. While his act gets laughs, Jerry is driven to drink by his other half's impish behavior, and Jerry's spotty attendance to his own shows has his agent laying down the law for the umpteenth and final time. Not helping his case, Jerry blames the dummy and makes one last-ditch effort to cook up a new act, and a new partner. But this proves to be far from curtains for Willie, whose voice permeates a locked trunk and continues to sound in his would-be boss's head. Driving him to mania, and finally to a confrontation he's been avoiding for over 110 missed shows. A ventriloquist becoming conquered by the character he created is a story that's been done before and done since, even in another episode of The Twilight Zone. But there's no discounting the dummy's place in its small subgenre's canon, nor its title as one of the Twilight Zone's finest psychological pieces. Didn't you forget someone? Didn't you forget Willie? The Jungle. In The Jungle. Alan Richards is an international businessman whose hatred for superstition belies an overwhelming fear for the wrath of an African tribe on whose land his business plans to build a hydroelectric dam. A fear which is realized when he finds a number of protective magic souvenirs brought back from their latest trip by his wife and burns them in defiance. 
Almost immediately afterwards, he starts entertaining the thought that he's right to fear for his life. His nightmare begins when he gets a phone call and escalates into a hellacious soundscape that turns a simple trip through the park to get home into a paranoid safari which no amount of machines, money, or good old American grit can help him to reverse. In an episode whose budget was probably spent mostly on the inclusion of one surprise guest star, the jungle manages to build a nerve-tightening atmosphere almost exclusively around stock sound effects and the urban jungle's only unique flavor of terror. 22. In what is probably the most genuinely scary adaptation of the E.F. Benson story, The Bus Conductor, a stripper... Dancer! Er, dancer, hospitalized for chronic fatigue, is haunted by a recurring dream each night she spends in her hospital room. A great thirst, followed by a shattering glass, and a night nurse outside her room who she is compelled to follow to room 22, the hospital's morgue. As she steals herself to enter, the nurse emerges with one chilling statement on her smiling lips. Room for one more, honey. <laughs> Within its runtime, little over 22 minutes, 22 manages to replay this sequence thrice, scaling up the suspense in little ways in each turn. Adding to the fever dream mood, this was one of a few episodes shot on video, which serves to give the picture an uncanny lifelike feel whilst adding an echoey gravity to the dialogue. This episode makes a good companion piece to perchance the dream, but substitutes its sequence dream for a recurring one, always ending in the same way. As Maya exudes unpredictability, the night nurse, played to simple perfection by Arlene Martell, embodies a firm glibness befitting the Grim Reaper. As our heroine remains convinced that her dream is really something more, the audience is held with the morbid fascination of what lies beyond a nightmare that ends just as it reaches its scariest scene. Living Doll Annabelle Strader buys her daughter Christy a talking doll in hopes of helping her through her confidence issues, but Christy's emotionally abusive stepfather Eric doesn't care for the idea of his wife buying a doll who spouts trite words of love, and his disapproval of the thing only gets deeper when talky Tina goes off script while no one else is listening and begins to deliver a series of increasingly sinister threats. My name is Talky Tina, and I think I could even hate you. Even with a title that's about as on the nose as one can be, Living Doll ignores easy shocks in favor of playing up one man's helplessness in the face of an implacable enemy who is welcomed into his home and whose true vindictive feelings are known only to him. For those of you who go into killer doll tales talking a big game about how you put an end to the doll with a big kick or some similar feat of strength, consider one who can't be burned, can't be chopped up and who tends towards subtler tactics than brandishing a knife in full view of everyone. That story doesn't end with a mangled doll being thrown in the trash. It ends with you being thrown away after alienating everyone you care about. Helly Savalas plays Eric as unsympathetic, but with just enough humanity and restraint to make the audience quiver along with him instead of outright rooting for the toy. But his attempts at playing nice are about as fruitless as his attempts to destroy the doll. And as his control over his castle falls, it becomes clear that Tina refuses to yield until the real root of the young Christie's insecurities is destroyed. My name is Talky Tina, and I don't forgive you. <laughs> it's a good life. In it, a boy who holds the power to read minds and to change reality in any way his imagination dictates has isolated a rural town from the rest of the world. He lives a simple life, eating tomato soup, watching television, and systematically wishing anyone who displeases him, says the wrong thing, attempts to stop his fun, even thinks bad thoughts about him or the world he controls into an unseen cornfield, never to be heard from again. We follow the few remaining inhabitants of Peakville on a day much like any other, as the boy, Anthony Fremont, creates and kills animals to amuse himself, the others spend all their time in an agonized, forced euphoria, knowing that if a single negative thought is heard, even from people the boy seems to like, or his own parents, 
it could be their last. It's uh, just that. Just that what? Well, Anthony, you uh, you wished them away into the cornfield. And the mommy and daddy were real upset. About what? But one thing sets this day apart. It's another resident's birthday, and someone had the bright idea to gift him a Perry Como record. Like the Grendel who plagued Beowulf, Anthony hates singing. And after realizing he won't get to hear his record at his party, or indeed at all, the birthday boy gets a little too drunk. That's not what I want you to play. Play this. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. It's a Good Life mixes the nightmare of an opinionated child with true power, with a hair trigger volatility that comes with the contradictory concept of not thinking any one thing, and translates this to the screen in a way that's genuinely disturbing, unlike certain other don't attempts. It's a story that Rod Serling describes simply as No comment here. No comment at all. Likely because digging into the volume of subtext you can take from it concerning the necessity of discipline and upbringing, the dubious innocence of childhood, and the implications of an all-powerful judge could well have gotten it kicked off the air in its time. It's a Good Life can be tough to watch even today, and earns its reputation as one of the series' most horrifying episodes. That's all the television there is. Well, talkers, we hope we shook the dust off some old sources of shivers for you all. If you happen to know of some scarier episodes you'd like to reintroduce to us, don't be afraid to share them in the comments below. And if you'd like to book a return flight to the Talk Horror Zone, just follow the signpost at the bottom of the video and subscribe. <laughs>